A lot of you people have already heard of a group known as Love Police. It's actually one person and has spawned a, a loyal following is the best way to put this. Charlie has recently woke up a couple of years ago and decided full time to be an activist. Uh, he put out a video this morning about depleted uranium and depleted uranium there's a big shit storm of disinfo out there. And of course the trolls will come in and attack you for mentioning the words depleted uranium. But what I decided to do just for Charlie, this is for Charlie, okay? Because I want to put this argument to rest once and for all. I'm going to uh, show you a bunch of clips. I'm going to jump in between each clips and hopefully articulate the importance of those clips and what some of the things you could take away from that or you should take away from that or I hope that you have an open mind and can take away from these short clips. I'll try to keep it short. Most likely I'm going to end up around whew, half an hour video. But in order to explain to anybody definitively what depleted uranium really means, it actually used to be called dull ram. First of all, I'd like to mention that DU, depleted uranium, had a prior name. And it was dull ram. All the military manuals refer to it as dull ram, D U L L R A M, which is depleted uranium, low level radioactive material. Well, they so eloquently remove the L L R A M and just call it depleted uranium now, and remove the L low level radiation part of it. Unutely enough. I don't know how they got to go hide that part. I don't know where the science was that allowed them to take those last four parts of the acronym off. So, this first clip, anyway, I'll get into that down the road here, but this first clip. This first clip, listen to every word this lady has to say. She used to be a scientist at Los Alamo for the government. She has been on lectures, making documentaries, radio interviews, by the hundreds a year. Okay, she doesn't hide away from nobody. And she has the history and the background and the knowledge to articulate to you things that you've never heard before. So here we go. We want to know, we wanted to find out how much DU was being manufactured in the U.S. because we suspected the, the U.S. was using a lot more. Now, um, one of the Japanese physicists who came to our Hamburg conference calculated that 800 tons of depleted uranium Re, if it's released into the air is the atomicity equivalent or the equivalent number of radioactive atoms as 41,000 Nagasaki bombs. We have released over a quarter of a million Nagasaki bombs equivalent radiation into our atmosphere. But what's even more alarming is um, that the McAllister Bomb Factory in Oklahoma, McAllister, Oklahoma, was applying for relicensing uh, at the NRC in order to be able to continue manufacturing DU weapons. And in order to maintain level one status, which they have to do to get relicensed, they must be able to ship 1,600 tons of depleted uranium weapons a day. That's, that's 166,000 Nagasaki bombs of radiation. It's 20 train car loads of DU going out of that factory every day. It's only one of four U.S. Army bomb factories. And all together, at all four bomb factories at any one time, they are allowed by the NRC to have up to 44,000 tons of DU on site. That's four and a half million Nagasaki bombs. Now, four and a half million Nagasaki bombs, let's put this in perspective, okay? Back in the 90s, the early 90s, I believe it was, Pakistan and India, tick for tack, fired off nine nuclear weapons each. And the whole planet took to the streets, every media on the planet demonized them, and at the same time, France was doing secret testing. They got caught at it. 
And the whole world went crazy because there was 18 nuclear weapons set off into the environment and it liberated all these isotopes. So imagine 4.5 million Nagasaki bombs worth of depleted uranium being stored in an open facility, not in a sarcophagus, trying to contain those isotopes. No isotope is so small it won't give you cancer. So Indian Pakistan sets off nine nuclear weapons each, the entire planet loses its mind. But because we put the same amount of radiation in bullets and fire it in other people's countries, people don't get that. You can't take radioactive materials and deliberately and willfully throw them in somebody else's backyard. Now, any place that we go, whether in Illinois where I come from, or here in Seattle, or in England, or any place around the world, if you were to take one pound of solid uranium-238 and throw it out in anybody's backyard or in your community park, or I just came from Massachusetts, if they were to throw it in the commons in Concord, Massachusetts, where our nation was born, you would go to jail forever. You would be in jail for a long time. However, the United States could take our radioactive waste, put it into munitions, and throw it into anybody else's backyard with immunity. Or so they continue to think. Depleted uranium is a very, very effective biological weapon. And it is being used to destroy the civilian population in regions that we would like to control. So this whole video will explain depleted uranium to you. And the next uh, clip coming up right now is Dr. Doug Rourke. And he's going to explain, explain that the different munitions and the different weapons used to fire that. And don't forget, at the end of this video, come back and listen to this first lady again, okay? Here we go. Dr. Doug Rocky is a depleted uranium expert. He earned his B.S. in physics at Western Illinois University, followed by his M.S. and Ph.D. in physics and technology education at the University of Illinois. His military career spanned four decades to include combat duty during the Vietnam War and Gulf War I. Doug served as a member of the 3rd U.S. Army Medical Command's Nuclear Biological Chemical MBC Teaching Medical Response and Special Operations Team, 3rd U.S. Army Captured Equipment. Depleted uranium munitions are solid uranium-238. They are not coated, they are not tipped. Each and every tank round fired by the Abrams tank is 10 pounds of solid uranium-238 contaminated with plutonium, neptunium, and americium. Now the contamination came from the U.S. Department of Energy manufacturing sites in Paducah, Kentucky, Oak Ridge, and Tennessee, and Portsmouth, and Ohio. solid uranium-238. Now, the A-10 Warthog aircraft, it's a phenomenal tank buster. It's excellent in combat, just like the Abrams tank is. Each individual round fired by the Warthog is three-quarters of a pound of solid uranium-238. They are not coated, they are not tipped. We fired about a million rounds of the A-30 millimeter during the Gulf War. 15,000 rounds of the tank round during the Gulf War for about 350 tons of solid uranium-238. The majority of the casualties during the Gulf War, the majority of those that died, the majority of the Americans that died during the Gulf War and that were injured in the Gulf War were as a result of friendly fire. The U.S. shooting the U.S. with uranium munitions. When I got the tasking, from the Pentagon down through Norman G. Schwarzkopf, directly to D.G. Zulis. Now, Schwarzkopf was the theater commander, overall, the top general. He was in charge of the war. D.G. Zulis was the theater medical commander, and I worked for him. They told me, clean up the D.U. mess. And I'm going to finish the job. And Dr. Doug Rourke was the chief guy from the Pentagon, tasked by Norman Schwarzkopf, whatever his name is, for the, the Gulf War to clean up the depleted uranium. We'll get more into that in a little tiny bit. But, now, if there's a shrapnel of depleted uranium on the ground, 
Now you just heard Dr. Doug Rourke talk about a million bullets fired. So each one of those bullets, what, um, what uh, um, Mr. Klein is going, uh, Dennis Klein is going to explain to you, is a procedure that was supposed to be utilized every time a depleted uranium round hit the ground. And I'm going to cover this a bit more at the end of this clip here. We are talking today with Dennis Kine. He is a veteran of the U.S. Army, 15 years experience, including operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. What would be the procedure for if you were in a combat situation and you did come upon a contaminated area and you were following the um, protocol for dealing with a contaminated area? Well, great question. I'd like to specifically address it with depleted uranium because the manuals have addressed depleted uranium prior. And uh, so uh, we know that in our manuals, what it says is if you come across a, an area that was hit with a depleted uranium round, and this, uh, heck, I'm, I'm imagining this is still at my website, this particular CTT training. And what they did was they, they called it an update. Now remember this manual is very old. They don't mind using old manuals, but the, the update states that if you end up in a depleted uranium contaminated area, you're to use the NATO marker, which indicates radiation. That's the marker we use, because if you go by an area of allied forces, we speak different languages, so they have universal triangles, which indicate whether it's biologically contaminated, nuclear contaminated, or chemically contaminated. One's yellow, red, and blue. So you take the one that says radiological radiation, and you put that in the area. And what you're supposed to do is if you get a Geiger counter, you find out how far out you go, and then you go, okay, don't cross this line right here. This is where it kicks out to. And you're supposed to post those, even if a depleted uranium round is hit there, which means the military knows that it's hot because they were telling us education-wise or academically-wise that it's hot. And if you find it, put the radioactive marker up there. And so that's what you're supposed to do when you arrive on a contaminated battlefield, is mark it so that your friends and your foes even, this is, it's all illegal to use this, all internationally, it's illegal to use these things, but we know they're going to get used, and should they get used, we're supposed to put these markers up so everybody in the whole world is aware of what's going on in that area. And we're trained to do that, but I bet you money that you're not seeing any markers anywhere, even on this conflict. But that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's, that's, our, that's our commitment to humanity, to do that at least. And I mean, there's 1.1 billion tons of depleted uranium in America right now that they've got to get rid of. And this is the way they're getting rid of it. They're hurling it all around the world. And, and, and no, I've never, I don't have one account of a marker ever being put anywhere. Not even in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, I bet they even put a marker up. So literally every single building in Iraq, Afghanistan, Palestine should have a, a, a marker around it. Because like if a round hits the ground, they know it's hot, right? They can't get away from that, see? So you're supposed to put this radioactive marker on four corners. And you're supposed to use a Geiger counter and walk away from the hit until the Geiger counter stops screaming and it'll scream for the next four billion years so that's why it's so important that you're supposed to use these markers and you're supposed to do that on the battlefield okay and that includes Iraq, Afghanistan and Palestine believe it or not you know it's illegal to use it right but they're using it and you still don't put the markers up see that way the entire planet anybody who comes across this sees this universal sign that says DANGER but instead, every school, every church, every library, every hospital, every food distribution center, everything, everything on the, everything, it's in the water, it's in the ground, it's in the food, it's in the plants. Depleted uranium is a very, very effective biological weapon, and it is being used to destroy the civilian population in regions that we would like to control. It's in migratory birds, man. Whew. Can you describe how depleted uranium gets into groundwater and the food chain and its effects there? Depleted uranium is going to get into the groundwater and the food chain multiple ways. You got all the uranium dust contamination, all the equipment that breaks down that then moves into the water table and in the water supplies. In the food you have uranium ions and everything that actually be absorbed into the plant structure. Now one thing that we do know, the United States Army's common task training specifically states 
that uranium contamination will make food and water unusable. So when you have that, ladies and gentlemen, and it also states in there they must wear full respiratory and skin protection, we also know it happens forever. Therefore, when the Army personally says that food and water will be contaminated, and that's an indiscriminate killer, that makes the use of depleted uranium a crime against God and a crime against humanity. Okay, so look. This next clip that's coming up right now is talking about Hanford with 40 miles. And I'm doing this to really drive the point home about this topic. So the next couple of clips are probably going to frighten you silly. Uh, hopefully frighten you into action and having a voice and realizing that you are powerful and that your words are powerful. And believe me, I'm arming you with knowledge that's invaluable. I've researched this all extensively over many years now and I realized this was a good opportunity for me to put this video out there and try to draw some light. The video coming up right now is talking about 40 miles of open air pits that are online and just before we start the clip remember the same dump in that town, it's illegal to have online pits for garbage. Yet, here he is with 40 miles, millions of gallons of this depleted uranium yellow cake out in the opening. And in a few moments, there's going to be a clip to explain to you what a Dixie cup this stuff can do. Um, and it's been said that a Dixie cup full of this waste in a crowded restaurant, everyone would be dead in the restaurant inside of an hour. And you can do that every hour for four billion years. Fill up McDonald's, leave a Dixie cup of this stuff in there, and every hour go and drag out 200 dead bodies and bring in another 200 people and go in another hour later and do that every hour for the next four billion years. There's 40 miles of open air pits, online pits, but let the experts tell you about this. It took until the year 2004 when we ran the statewide ballot initiative trying to stop Hanford from being National Radioactive Waste Dump before the federal government finally ended dumping radioactive waste in unlined ditches. I know this sounds incredible to people, but there are 40 miles of unlined trenches at Hanford you stretch them end to end, into which our federal government, your government, was dumping radioactive waste from nuclear weapons production and its own reactors until the year 2004 when we put those pictures um, on air and in our campaign literature for Initiative 297. Um, it's been against the law for decades for a municipal government to dump un in municipal garbage in unlined landfills. But our federal government thinks it's okay for radioactive waste, even though it seeps right out of those trenches and starts moving to the Columbia what you River. What find is they're not planning to do a lot of cleanup. They weren't planning to go after the groundwater contamination. Well, Hanford has 200 square miles of contaminated groundwater uh, below the site there, and that is spreading over time because the contaminants in the soil are leaking at a constant rate into the, uh, you know, into the groundwater. Um, the there's actually a slowdown in cleaning up some of the worst of the worst at Hanford, which is the waste, uh, high-level nuclear waste in these underground tanks. So Hanford has 177 million gallon tanks buried beneath the soil, and these tanks were the recipient of some of the high-level radioactive waste that came from the reprocessing of nuclear fuel. Uh, this is probably the most dangerous stuff on the planet ever. Uh, very, very small quantities of this waste. Um, and it's been said that a Dixie cup full of this waste in a crowded restaurant, everyone would be dead in the restaurant inside of an hour. Uh, if, even the amount that would fit on the leg of a fruit fly uh, is considered a problem dose. And that's happened at Hanford. Fruit flies have landed on contaminated materials and then flown off to go to the lunchroom and deposit contamination on food and on tables and whatnot, and they've had to evacuate a 20-acre area at the Hanford site because of uh, hot fruit flies and wasps. So this, this waste in these tanks is very dangerous in small quantities. 
And it has another feature, which is it's dangerous for very, very long periods of time. And For very, very long periods of time, like four billion years. Now think about what he's saying. A fruit fly closed down 20 acres at a nuclear facility. A fruit fly. So don't you think there's a possibility that with 40 miles of online pits that there's going to be more than one fly or more than one wasp or more than one mammal or insect or bird over 40 miles? We know there could be thousands and thousands in just a few hundred square feet of flying insects out in these areas, these bushy, damp areas. So imagine all these insects interbreeding uh, or, or because of the, the infected ones breeding with normal ones, etc., etc. And you end up with this, this catastrophic environmental thing going on. We're talking 200 miles of groundwater. We're talking 170 million gallon tanks that are, are rotten and deteriorating and leaching into the environment. You're literally going to have to dig up 200 miles of land. It's kind of like those little bullets that are being fired, millions of bullets being fired in Iraq and Afghanistan and Palestine. Every building needs to be removed. 900 feet of topsoil needs to be dug up 4 inches deep. And all of this needs to go to a nuclear containment site, put in sarcophagus for the next billions of years. We don't even know how to build something like that. In order to really wrap your mind around all of that, I think that Dixie Cup says it all. A Dixie Cup full of this yellow cake from that 40 mile pit. You put that in a restaurant, you'll kill everybody there within an hour for the next four billion years. Like I said earlier, just keep filling that restaurant up. And all these flies and all this open air pits that are liberating the isotopes from this depleted uranium and they're into the environment and they, they hook onto everything. They end up everywhere. If you're creating, created, cremated after you died, excuse me, it's not funny, then you liberate the isotopes that was in that body. Can you see what I'm saying to you folks? It's not just McAllister's bomb manufacturing facility producing 166,000 Nagasaki bombs were the depleted uranium munitions a day, 20 train car loads for the slow boat to Afghanistan and Iraq. All of that stuff liberates and gets something to the environment and is worldwide within a year. I encourage you strongly to look in my description and I'll have links to all these people to their full un unedited like I'm just doing clips to, to, to make a demonstration for you, to, to point you in that direction, to get you to commit yourself to just thinking. I know a lot of people want to live in ignorance, but look what it's doing to us. Look what a Dixie cup of this stuff can do to us. Projectiles are very, very good. They go through a tank like knife through butter is the way it's usually described. The problem is that when depleted uranium fires and hits a target, it's um, polyphorus. It means that it explodes and burns. When it burns, it, it turns into, it vaporizes, and when it's breathed in, it has a very, very serious effect on the human body. Many of the scientists who were looking into depleted uranium back in the as, as early as the 50s, looking into low-grade radiation poisoning, identified a number of problems from exposure to low-grade radiation and exposure to depleted uranium dust is that kind of low-grade radiation. So what we saw uh, as a result of the Gulf War I was an enormous number of our troops being infected with illnesses and conditions and anomalies that are linked to low-grade radiation and the fact that their offspring showed a very very high incidence of disability. When I found out about depleted uranium in 1996 I knew that it was impossible to use such a weapon in a way that would be legal. So I brought that situation to the United Nations but first the Commission on Human Rights in 1996 and in the summer of 1996 
the subcommission on human rights that sits under the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. These sessions are in Geneva. Now this clip is Dennis Klein's um, talking about the highway of death, the Persian Gulf War. Uh, he talks about when the soldiers first runs into the depleted uranium and what happened to them. And I'll just let him elaborate a little bit. When the soldiers ran into the depleted uranium, everybody got sick. It was immediate, you know. Uh, Soldiers got sick, very sick, very quick, pale as a ghost, vomiting, uh, the whole thing, all signs and symptoms of radiological exposure. And uh, so what they did was they put us in our vehicles and called this ceasefire. And I happened to have been at the airfield where the ceasefire was supposed to be congregating. We went out there because we thought Norman Schwarzkopf was coming. We wanted to see him. He was our hero, right? They never showed up. We were the only four people out there, I think. You know, So... Uh, Basically, the ceasefire, the next day we were in our vehicles going all the way back to the rear, sleeping underneath our vehicles all the way back. If night fell, we just crawled underneath our truck and slept there, probably breathing the particles that were falling off of it. And we got back real quick and got onto a TWA airplane and came home. We didn't fly home on C-130s or C-141s. We left our vehicles in Daha Ran, got on private aircraft because a lot of these soldiers were going to die, and they knew it. And they didn't want them to die on the battlefield because they would have had been considered combat casualties. So they rushed us right home where everybody buzzed like a radio antenna for a little while. And uh, what they did was they sent a whole new crew of soldiers up front to do what I refer to as cleanup. But more, more important, it should be referred to as a crime and a disguise because they didn't want the mainstream media to see what had happened on that highway. So the engineers dug trenches on the side of the road and buried everybody in them and covered them up. Makes me kind of wonder what the mass graves they're finding this time really are. But uh, that, there's, there's all kinds of evidence that that actually occurred. Some of the Iraqi conscripts were actually still alive when they were buried in the sand. But Dennis was just talking about, I rang my bell and I went looking for the clip. I just found that other clip. I'll play it right here for you now. Fearing that the troops would revolt, as they had in Vietnam, and turn the guns around on the officers, until the day they actually went to engage in Kuwait, they didn't issue them any live rounds. Then, because they know that body counts is a problem, and as those go up, the opposition to the war would grow, they developed a strategy that I believe was a direct war crime when they actually went to engage in Kuwait. They had taken the youngest conscripts, the 16, 17-year-old conscripts, not the Republican Guard, but just the, the chaff of the military, and put them up in trench warfare lines all along the desert in front of the American troops. So these kids are down in the trenches. Well, the, they, they moved forward with tanks and, and, uh, and other equipment as a line toward these trenches. They put helicopters into the air that have these guns that will fire like 3,600 rounds in a, in a second and just blanket lead across an, a given area and they started firing down into the trenches and the people started trying to put up white flags and uh... and 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 they specifically shot at anybody that was trying to surrender in the gulf war was was being somebody that would shoot at a white flag but that was common that they would go after the people who were trying to surrender so they wouldn't let the troops surrender they shot into the trenches and kept them trapped in the trenches with this massive fire meanwhile the tanks put earth movers on the front and they also had plows and they pushed the desert sand forward and buried the people alive and then the troops and this was in the Washington Post the troops marched behind and talked about seeing arms and hands wiggling of people still dying in the sand as they were marching over them and I mean if you think the Vietnam vets had some traumatic stress disorder problems I think some Gulf vets are going to have some nightmares too see that might explain why there's 18 soldiers committing suicide every single day Every single day, I'm thrown to the dirt to commit suicide. Or be like some of these vets who go around telling their side of the story. I'll let them go around. And But I mean, to me, this is directly just a war crime. I mean, it, it, the people trying to surrender and they bury them alive and then march the troops through, but they defended them on the grounds that none of the U.S. troops were shot. You know, so it was a very cruel and very uh, inhumane thing to have done. And they told us while we were getting back, we're like, what's going to happen up there, man? It's pretty nasty. You know, and they're, well, yeah, the bodies are bloating, they're getting stinky, and we know Saddam won't clean up his own people. They acted like they were dignified in this mission. Saddam isn't going to clean up his own people, so we'll have to clean it up for him. <laughs> but it wasn't for anybody. It was, it was to hide the, the mess that had been created, the melting of these human bodies and get that stuff in the bottom of the ground. And that's what they did. Well, we flew home and everybody got sick. These soldiers that went in after me, 
are much sicker than the soldiers who were there for that 72 hours because the particles that get created uh, a lot of you know a lot of doctors are talking about aerosolized particles I like to refer to it as radioactive fallout nuclear fallout if you will and they want to talk aerosolized particles that's fine but the term is it's radioactive and it's the fallout and it's these are these particles and a 1961 document that the Stanford, Stanford uh, put out, and it's not even a document, it's pretty much a, an academic journal that says these particles cook off, they're called metallurgical particles, they cook off to be smaller than bacteria or viruses, which indicates to us that we can't see them, because you can't even find a bacteria or virus without a super microscope. So these particles are so small you need a sub-micron filter to keep them out. So if you need a sub-micron filter to keep it out, there is no way to keep it out, okay? Because not everybody's going to go around with these expensive, bulky devices on their face. In fact, nobody is. They don't even use them. So everybody gets contaminated. I guess that's a way of getting rid of the witnesses, you know what I mean? Um, we're almost at the end of it here now. This next clip is going to be um, Dennis Klein again. And he's going to give you an example of soldiers coming back uh, from that conflict and bringing their weapons back with them and what happened because they were they were bringing contaminated depleted uranium dust back home into their homes with them and it's just a short clip they bring home an AK-47 and stuff it in the bottom of their helicopter and so when the helicopter came home they would pull it out so for an extended period of time these soldiers would break out their equipment back on the living room floor and liberate these particles again and their children would die because the babies and these infants can't sustain low-level radiation at all. And so there's plenty of accounts of, of soldiers losing their children to, to this, these particles that they brought back after our scenario. Our scenario is like a gamma radiation scenario. There's accounts of some Marines and soldiers who came home and their inner organs fell out their backside, just like the females of Hiroshima and Nagasaki when their ovaries fell out. You know, their organs have just been melted by gamma radiation. So the depleted radiation. uranium actually melts the organ, liquefies them. So can you imagine a country that shot up with depleted uranium and embargoes against them so they can't import things, so they have to shift through all this dust, all this contaminated for the next four billion years um, consumer goods looking for salvage and things out of it, including stuff to build their new home with. And we wonder why there's such a large increase of babies being born in Iraq and Afghanistan and Palestine with no eyes or no nose or no ears or no face or no, no digits, no arms, lumps of flesh. But let's um, close it down with Doug Rourke explaining to you that depleted uranium, there's nothing depleted about it whatsoever. It's a misnomer. That's the whole idea, right? First off, the term depleted is a misnomer. There's nothing really depleted about it. The, uh, uranium emissions are actually the byproduct of the uranium enrichment process conducted by the U.S. Department of Energy. For every 100 pounds of pure uranium that goes in the enrichment process, 99.2 pounds is pure waste. Okay? And that's what we call uranium hexafluoride which is a process to form uranium munitions. Uh, uranium munitions consist of kinetic energy penetrators or bullets, so we have the 5.56 millimeter, the 7.62 millimeter, and the 50 caliber. Those are rifle bullets that are made out of the uranium. Then we have the 20 millimeter for the Navy phalanx, the 25 millimeter for the Army Bradley fighting vehicle and the Marine Corps lab, etc. the 30 millimeter for on the gunships and everything in the A-10, then we get up to the uh, tank rounds, 105 millimeter, 125 millimeter, and, 100, and the primary 120 millimeter. Now these are all gigantic slugs of uranium. And what they're actually made of is uh, uranium hexafluoride was the primary product that went into it. But what we end up with is these isotopes, uranium-234, uranium-235, which is the uranium-236, uranium-238, which is the predominant amount, probably 99% of it, plutonium, neptunium, and americium. So we have a toxic radiological compound that this stuff is made up of. So what we end up with is a whole host of uranium emissions. 
the kinetic energy penetrators were to like bullets or giant rods of uranium. Think a gigantic dart. You know, everybody's played dart. That's what these look like. Except that the tank round is 10 pounds of uranium, and the 30 millimeter round that's fired by the A10 is three quarters of a pound of uranium, fired at 4,000 rounds a minute. That's one and a half tons of uranium on target per minute. Incredible amount of volume of uranium radioactive materials. And then up and beyond that, we have the atom and the pedum. Now, the atom and the pedum, think about a giant softball. The outer case into the softball is made of uranium, DU, and it's filled with high explosives. Incredibly effective against all personnel and animals and children and everything else. Totally used by the Israelis in Lebanon. Anyway, best wishes you and your loved ones. Some people have described it that we will be at war with Iraq till the end of Earth because we cannot turn off the weapons that we used against Iraq. This is the time test. You have to be able to stop the weapons at the end of the war. So um, we are at war with Iraq for the end of time.